Welcome to Trail Manners, the podcast so dedicated to mountain trails and running that they broadcast out of a 78 Volkswagen bus in the mountains. Who does that? Eric and Joel are your hosts and will bring you the trail life as you may have not heard it before. You hear about everything from gear reviews, nutrition to keep you upright and moving forward, and they'll even bring guests into the bus for conversations that you won't hear anywhere else. It's time for some running adventures on a higher elevation. The old 78 Volkswagen bus is fired up and headed to the mountains. Here are your hosts for Trail Manners, proudly representing the 801 with their passion and love for the trails, Eric Manning and Joel Hatch. Hello and welcome to the Trail Manners Podcast, episode number 75. Today, we are going to be talking via telephone, something a little different for us here, with Chrissy Mail. So if this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The Trail Manners Podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at trailmanners.com. Come back often, and please feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trail Manners. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get after it. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Trail Manners, Manners Podcast. We have an awesome guest on today, and it took us a while to figure this out. And so, our well, it's guest- the second time we've used this eCam recorder, and it actually works really good when it works. <laughs> so when it works, right? So we're sitting here, uh, Joel's place. I'm sitting on a uh, what do you call these? Stability ball. Stability ball. So I'm gonna have some rock hard abs after the show. But we've got a an author. A coach, public speaker, race director, and just an all-around global icon. We have Chrissy Mel with us today. Hi, Chrissy. Hi, guys. <laughs> so you've been going through the pains with us trying to figure this thing out, so we can't tell you thanks enough for bearing yeah. with us to get through this. But we figured it out. I don't like the technology to win. And we won. Yep. So you've got something big on the horizon here in a couple of weeks that we want to start off with. You've got the Chuck and Nut 50K coming up, right? I do. Yeah, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary this year. So I'm putting a lot of energy into it. I've got three co-RDs that have jumped on board and are going full force. Um, this is my 15th year doing it. So some of the stuff is kind of push button play. We know how to do it, but I threw in a bunch of new Fun things, too, just to make the celebration bigger and better. How about that? Including 200 extra runners. So we're going to have a full field, more than full. Wow. So you said you've done this for 15 years, and it's it's a 25th anniversary. So how did you get roped into taking over as RD? Well, I say be careful which ultra is your first because you will always have a special place in your heart for it. And that's what happened here. The race directors decided at the 10th anniversary that they were done. That was my, I think, second time running it. Hmm. And then I was worried it was just going to disappear, and I didn't want to see the Chuck and Nut 50K go away. So the following year, which was 2003, I took over as race director. And it's been nothing but smooth sailing, right? Oh, man. I think you said you noted earlier that I'm an author. One of the book that I think needs to be written is a collaboration of all race directors getting together to tell their stories. Cause I would not call it smooth sailing. There's so many funny things that come out of being a race director. Well, me and Joel are amateur race directors, so we don't have to do quite what you guys do, but we have some good friends that we talk to Ty Draney, Jim Skaggs, few others. Um, oh, yeah. And it's just, it's interesting for us to hear all the quirky and weird things that pop up. Requests, requests, demands, you, yeah, demands. Year over year. mile markers. Can you guys have mile markers on the course? And you're like, no, it's a trail run. Trail run. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you think of some of the interesting things that have come up through your 15 years that it's not like a norm, but maybe it's kind of things that had you scratch in your head? I think it's always the behind the scenes stuff. Like uh, one year I used my dad's truck to um, haul water and I blew up the engine. So <laughs> the night before the race, off, I've blown the transition on my dad's truck. Uh, How much yeah, water were you hauling? <laughs> uh, I think I had it in the wrong gear or something. <laughs> and then, 
<laughs> she and had the first year all the way. The other one was my parents' basement flooded. So for the first 13 years of the race, we ran race headquarters out of my parents' house. And they were very thankful when I bought my place this year because all of the Chuck and that stuff was moved in before I actually moved into my place. But their house endured a lot of race, um, what do you want to call it, hold up or hang ups or whatever, and their basement flooded one year. So, again, 10 p.m. the night before the race starts, we're dealing with a flooded basement at the uh, race headquarters. Well, there's just all this behind-the-scenes stuff that factors in on race day that hopefully the runners never see. That's my, my goal anyway. I think that's a mark of a good race director. Yeah, that they don't. <laughs> Because on a racing side, since we all race and, you know, a lot of people out there just race, they just think, oh, I, I come, I pick up my bib, I run the race, and there's refreshments at the end. Yeah. Right? That's smooth. That's easy. Yeah, but then they come. Yeah, but then if there's not, if there's not the right refreshment, oh, that's the worst. <laughs> These are the things that I worry about. Well, I have the right refreshment. <laughs> well, especially anymore with all the stuff that people are using, not just solid foods or normal foods, but the nutrition side as well with the different companies and stuff out. I think she's talking about beer <laughs> is what she's talking about. <laughs> if you don't have the, beer, right, is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. If you don't have the right IPA, yeah. somebody gets upset. Yeah. You know? right. <laughs> Especially being from Washington. I mean, we've got whole sorts of breweries up here. That's right. Yeah. You have to get multiple sponsors for, for your, I'm not, not talking like gear. I'm talking like brewery sponsors. Exactly. <laughs> and Bellingham's awesome for that. Our brewery scene is top notch, not only in terms of the great beer that they, and I'm not much of a beer consumer, but um, not only for the great beer, but how they collaborate and support each other. I think it's a super cool community that way because I know some places can get competitive in industry and our beer industry is just everybody supports each other. It's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. the, so the race itself is in Bellingham, Washington. And, and you mentioned you have uh, some other RDs helping you out this year. Who did you uh, who did you wrangle into helping for this big big festival this year? Uh, a bunch of great local uh, people that I've known in and out of the industry, and then one new girl that just moved back. Um, Alita Prenville has worked for Race the Planet before, so she is handling a lot of our social media and that kind of stuff. Tyler Pooley is a local Parks and Rec employee, but also high school coach for the track team and has a pretty good niche with the software technology side. He's somebody you'd want in your corner, Eric, after your technology phobia. I've got somebody that takes care of that stuff hmm. this year, which is so helpful. And then Kevin Douglas is a local uh, ultra runner. He puts on the Lost Lake 50K and he took on the volunteer coordination, which is so helpful. That's, That's always an important piece of any race. How many volunteers do you guys have? This year, we're looking at over 100. Usually, we're around 60 to 75, but with the increased number of runners and um, all of that, we're going to need closer to 100 and, 125, 150, I think. Holy cow. It's working out. That's, that's awesome that yep. you can generate that many volunteers for, for the race. And you have about, what, 500 runners? Is that right? That's, yeah. We're, our goal for race day is 500. We're registered at a 523 right now and that's kind of that guessing game of well how many people end up not showing up on race day and we've already had i actually wrote five thousand dollars worth of refund checks this year which is crazy and um was able to put that many more people back in the race wow that's great so how how's the course run does it handle 500 runners really well I think so. The first 10K is on the inner urban, so a wide gravel path. Right. And then they head up into the middle 30K, which is what the race is kind of known for. You run up Cleeter Road and um, hit the Chuckanut Ridge, and that's if it's a beautiful day, you can see Mount Baker. We also have a photo there in case it's not a beautiful day so that you can see what the view would look like <laughs> if you <laughs> That's awesome. on a clear day, which in March in Washington – uh, the photo is usually the better chance of getting to see the view. Um, yeah, and then down along the Lost Lake, the muddy part, and then we have a mini chin scraper, which is named for that race in your backyard, uh, the Wasatch Front 100. Uh, ours comes at about mile 22, and it's a mile long, pretty steady climb. There's some little steep hits in there. 
And Glenn Takayama's always there taking photos of everybody coming over the steepest part. Um, and then you run back down Fragrance Lake Road, hit the aid station that was the first aid station, which is now the last aid station, and you've got the 10K back to Fairhaven Park. So that first 10K is where everybody gets all spread out. Totally, yeah. And it's also where people can get in the most trouble because they take off fast. It's like, I think that first 10K is like net downhill. Oh. So it feels like super cruisy. It's not noticeable downhill, but you can definitely go out too fast if you're not. So with 500 runners, do you guys have a mass start? Or are you going to stagger them? We're going to do a mass start. We're starting in Fairhaven Park and hopeful that runners will be patient. What's important to me is uh, using the chip timing as a safety guard. So I need everybody to run across that timing mat. Right. so that I know where they were are on the course. Right. So, yeah, and I, I hope with a 50K Ultra, people are pretty cool about a couple minutes here or there. And I, they'll get their chip time that way too. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like Joe was mentioned, generally they are. And, and so when we talked about it, you said the course is going back to what you call the classic course, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So what's, yeah. what's, the, what's the difference between the classic course or, or what makes that is different that, than the one in the past? Right. So the one in the past, this is we, when I took it over from Doug McKeever, he started the race, started and finished the race in Fairhaven Park, which is where we're back to now. And that in, uh, in 2012, we celebrated the 20th anniversary and had 700 runners, which was beyond what I was able to manage. That's why we're going to 500 this year. Um, uh, and we parked down at Sixth and Harris, which is about a mile from Fairhaven Park. So that added a mile on the front end and the back end of the running on the inner urban. So we changed some of the middle 30K to accommodate that. So now moving, bumping back up to the Fairhaven Park, we remove those extra two miles. We're able to go back to using the trails that we were using before um, on the classic course. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And one of the one of the things that we talked about too, because we've had a few other guests on the show that are race directors and, and runners, rightly so. But uh, one thing that you talk about as well is you're, you're a coupless race, so you're moving towards the zero waste portion of it as well. Yeah. We've had yeah, yeah. yeah we've had Luke Nelson on, and I know he's such a huge proponent of that with his smut race. Um, what have you found mm -hmm. some of the challenges there with going coupless with runners? Is that something that's being embraced pretty well? Do you think? I think now, um, it initially, it was just like a service that was expected, and I received emails like, I paid my entry fee. I think I should be able to at least have a cup at an aid station. And mm -hmm. there was some kind of negative response to it, feeling that people people felt like they were getting gypped. And that took a little bit of explaining, like, no, no, no. Like, it actually cost me more right. because I'm trying to do compostable on the stuff that I do provide. And we have to, we, initially we had to buy a lot more um, uh, containers and stuff to haul things in. And we set ourselves up to be sustainable over the long haul. But it definitely wasn't at a cost savings to the race or an, an intention to jip the runners by any means. Um, the other thing that just continues to be a, hard, a tricky bit, and I would advise any race director, is having enough volunteers to sort the garbage because people are tired they run 50k they don't want to look at pictures and figure out which mm -hmm. bin put what in and so our recycling bin or our trash bin ended up being filled with recycling stuff or vice versa and i would find myself sorting garbage at the end of a race which is kind of the last thing you <laughs> ever want to especially at the end of a really 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 long day or week so yeah just having some volunteers that are there like hey that one goes in this bin or that goes in this bin those are little tricks that we've, um, we're hoping to implement this year to keep the recycling bit not a headache, a okay. benefit and not a headache. I think that'd be really good for other race directors to adopt that same thing because then you're kind of like training the runners to kind of expect that experience, not only at your race, but maybe at other races. So that way okay. we automatically like, oh, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like reprogramming their expectations like it you is. talked about with the couple of stuff. Because now you see that more and more when you go to register for a race. Hey, this cake cup, this race is coupless. Right. That's what you expect now. And you see more and more of that, especially on the trail side. So I think 
that what you just mentioned with the volunteers sorting through that, I think that's huge. That's that, a big difference. Well, right having there. that volunteer there directing you, because when we ran Smut last year, Luke had it set up where you could throw your goo wrappers in, in one thing and then your paper in the other. And like you said, when you're tired at the end of the race, you're brain dead. Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah. wait a minute, where's this go? <laughs> so it's nice to have that Even volunteer if, there. Yeah. Even if there's a picture sitting right in front of you, it's well, does mine fit into that one? That one says goo, but I have a cliff bar. Yeah, yeah exactly. See, that, that would, yeah. That would be, <laughs> you can't make sense of it when you're tired. Yeah. I would be I would be exactly like that. Or I'd say, no, that's not the flavor I just had. Where's, where's my flavor bin? <laughs> yeah. Right. Where's the IPA bin? Yeah, right. And, yeah, exactly. So, so you mentioned it's 25th, and 25th is huge. I mean, in anything, you know, whether it's, you know, a work anniversary, you know, anything. So what kind of special things do you have planned um, for these runners when they finish or during the race itself? You mentioned a few, but what's kind of, what are things that you're looking forward to for the 25th anniversary? Uh, well, this might seem super silly to some, but I am super stoked about it is a photo booth. I was at a wedding last September, and this guy had this awesome setup. It's all digital, and it's not an actual booth, but it's a screen that you stand in front of. And I just thought, and you, um, I paid the extra money so that everybody can have a free print, and it's got the Chuck and at 50K logo on. And I don't know, I'm a total photo girl, and that's like one of the best memories I can imagine. So I'm hoping the community and the runners both will like jump in front of that thing and we'll print off. We'll run the guy out of paper. How about that? I mean, I guess that's not towards zero waste, but it is a good memory, hmm. a good takeaway from the event. Well, as much as many um, selfies oh. we see online from runners, I don't think you're going to have any problem no. filling. filling yeah. there, right? <laughs> you're going to have to limit like, okay, just three photos per runner. Three poses. Per person. No, but that's awesome. That's yeah. a great idea. That's really cool. I think we're going to have to borrow that from her. Yeah, right. That's a really good idea. <laughs> what else you got? Um, so yeah, we, you, you guys have already mentioned the whole beer connection. I am working with a Mir, M I I R, it's a, a company that. I pulled my headset out. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go. I am working with a a, a company that makes um, double double walled steel pints or whatever, and we did a special design on them. And every finisher gets one. I've never done a finisher's prize. I We do age group awards, and we have a ton of swag. I work with some amazing volunteers on a personal level, and then I bring those all into my race directing so that I can share the products that I use on a daily basis with all of the runners. And, I mean, I'm giving away, like, sunglasses and shoe certificates and Houdini jackets and all sorts of amazing stuff to our runners. So I've never done the like finisher's prize, but to celebrate the 25th anniversary and in keeping with our like reduced waste, we're providing everybody with their finishing drinking beverage, like the, the vessel to, um, to celebrate with. How about that? That's awesome. That is good. You're going to have uh, like erasable markers so they can write their name on the cup so they don't lose it. <laughs> oh, you're brilliant. I think that's a good idea. I think it's a great, I'm going to get a post-it note right now. Yeah, <laughs> and then you you also what you mentioned you're gonna have some food trucks. Yeah, so for many years, the local bookstore, Bookstore Cafe, has provided soup for the 300 runners. We typically have three to 350 runners in the race. With 500 runners, I could not imagine asking like uh, such an awesome guy. His name's Charles to make that much soup. And then my mom has served it. So for many years, a lot of people have mistaken the soup that Ma Mail made soup for 350 <laughs> runners, and they love the fact that she's serving it. So give credit, Book Fair Cafe has made soup, and Ma Mail has served it, and we've had girls on the run come out and help volunteer and everything to minimize that workload. And, I mean, that's a huge request of volunteers just in feeding people alone. We put um, – I took some of the entry fee money and put it towards food trucks. So each runner on their bib will have a five dollar coupon. They can get something from one of the food trucks, and then the food trucks are there to feed everybody as well. So if the community comes in, crews, spectators, they'll have additional food as well for purchase. Oh, that sounds really tasty. It does right now, <laughs> <laughs> and I can imagine you've got, got our pretty good food trucks. Well, yeah, we've got a rock and scene for food trucks. It's kind of surprised me. We've got El Agave, which is a Mexican 
place coming out, and then a pizza truck, Goat Mountain Pizza, as our our two local ones. And then hopefully, like fingers crossed, we just have to be able to provide them power to have a coffee, Bellingham Coffee Roasters, be out there serving not only just black coffee, but all the fancy drinks too. Yeah, those fancy schmancy ones after the race that'd be good. And then and then you're having a big post post race party somewhere, right? Wander Brewing, had, the owner ran the race as his first ultra last year, and we hosted a post party there. So we're going for it again this year, opening up the doors, having a tent, and bringing in the Dudley Brothers, which is a local kind of bluegrassy band. And um, gotta have cake. You're celebrating 25 years. <laughs> have a big cake, big raffle prize drawing. Um, we raised twelve hundred dollars in three days for our local girls on the run chapter last year, so we're hoping to beat that goal this year with awesome prizes from our sponsors, Patagonia, Basque, Protex, Flora, Gore Tex jumped on board this year. I've got a garage full of stuff. But we've got all sorts of fun things to give away. Man. It's uh That it's, sounds pretty good. This race has always been on my list. Uh, I had some friends run it, I don't know, nine plus years ago. And nothing but mm. good things about it. So it's always been on my list. For it's on sure. my list for next year. Yeah, but you know, it's it's yeah. it's a little tougher to get up there. A little bit. And the one thing I always hear is March is such a like oh I've been skiing all winter I'm not ready to race yet and I feel like everybody's kind of in that boat. So and when the race started it was early season March like way too cool and chucking up 50k were kind of the kickoff races races of the year and. Right. I know you guys have witnesses, but you can race year round now. There is no like kickoff anymore. Yeah, there's no off season anymore. Fall into the season. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we've we've talked about that quite a bit because down here, kind of the kickoff race has always been Moab Red Hot, and now there's ra- mm-hmm. races before that now that are yeah. pretty solid races too. So um, it's just like you mentioned, you just they're racing year round pretty much now. Mm-hmm. And we've got, you know, we've got some, uh, one of our, we call him a local guy because he's out of Utah and he's been on the show coming up. Hayden Hawks is supposed to be racing up there um, for the Chuck and Nut. Yeah, my, um, so the founder of the race, Doug McKeever, is still heavily involved in the event. I can go to him as a great sounding board for so much of the things that come up as a race director. Um, local legend knows every peak along this well i give him credit for the whole washington state he's a retired um, geology professor so super knowledgeable of the area he's picked hayden as the as the way and i'll, I'll put it out there that that little pressure is on hayden coming from wow <laughs> well Joel, yeah. joel's gonna be racing uh, hayden hawks at the uh, red mountain 55k coming up in two days yeah <laughs> so there you go Joel's, Joel's, is there money on you yeah he's gonna try and beat him for like a mile, <laughs> I'll warm him up. I'll be the rabbit for the first mile. But uh, so the the website's just chucking up fifty k race dot com. Is that right? You got it. Yep. Yeah, it's one of the I had chucking up fifty k for a while, and some Asian I hate to say it out loud Asian porn site bought it. And so if you go to chucking at fifty k, it's not my site. So oh. you race. It's my website. I was That's crazy. weird. Uh, it's kind of weird. It was going to cost me like thousands of dollars to buy that site back. It was yeah, ridiculous. that's lame. That's ridiculous. But and you mentioned earlier, you've got a lot of good, you know, sponsors that are helping you out with the race, uh, but also a lot of like what you call supporters too. Like you were talking, you know, Wander Brewing, and you got a good running scene up there too. So there's a lot of involvement from some sponsors and supporters on that end. Totally, and the coolest part, I think is I have lived away 13 of the 15 years. Last year was the first year I lived in the community and put on the race. But in the probably the last like five to six years, I've like got this buzz from people that it's our 50K, the local Bellingham 50K, but checking out 50K is our race. Local magazines are publishing bits about it, including it in their ads and their race calendars, whether I've put my, you know, put it in there or not. And so even though the race director wasn't living here, the community has totally like sucked onto this event. And now that I live here and I talk to people and say, oh yeah, I'm the race director that's checking at 50K, you see this light bulb come on like, oh, that's our race. You're the race director? <laughs> it's such a cool thing that the community's like held on to like as their own, whether I'm part of it or not. I think that's probably the coolest bit. So for people, I mean, it's already, you know, 
too late this year, but when does registration generally open up? So if people are listening to this or they want to get on board for next year, when can they kind of look for that? This year we did it in early December, and I'll probably do that again. We typically do the first Friday in January, but I, I liked having it before the holidays, so I'll probably stick with that for next year. I always put it up on the website. That's a good idea because if you do it after the holidays, I'm always broke. Right. So I can register. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So are you going to keep it at 500 people then uh, going forward? No, no. The big years, the 20th and the 25th, I've gone to bigger field sizes. But um, I really love the 3 to 350 number. I feel like I have a better opportunity to chat with people. Uh, it's more one on. It's not really one on one, but it's, I feel like I can be more integrated. These bigger numbers, I feel uh, a little bit separated from it. And I'm hoping by having three co RDs that we can have a better ratio. And I will get that vibe. But you know, you're you're doing this for pennies on the hour. Let's be honest. So I I'm about having fun on that day. And numbers is I I learned in the 20th anniversary having too many can make it. Uh, Stressful, no, I mean, it's stressful no matter what, but it's usually good stress. That that day got, it made it really hard to come back the following year, and I don't want to create that. I want to, I want to have longevity. I think 15 years is pretty good, but heck, I could do it for another 15 more if I am sustainable in my thinking. Okay, so those years that you have the smaller numbers, how quickly do you sell out? It's usually over the weekend. So I open registration Friday morning, and it's usually sold by Sunday night. This year we opened Thursday morning. I, um, I'm not sure why that ended up happening to be honest, but it ended up being Thursday morning. It was closed by Friday, Friday afternoon. So wow. I think the buzz of the 25th anniversary um, filled it a little faster than normal. And obviously it was almost double the amount of spots. We sold 550 spots that day. And do you go to the wait list then once it's filled? I have, yeah. So runners can tell me by February, this year it was February 22nd, it's usually middle of February. If they can't make it, and I'll give them a, it's a $70 refund of their $95 registration fee. And then um, I open those spots to wait listers after that. How this year we also long? accommodated a lot of extra elites because we had the USATF and the uh, team the Canadian team are both using Chuck and I as a qualifying race for the world 50 K championships. Oh. So I had to, had to chose to, however you want to look at it, um, allow people that were racing for those spots. And even if they registered after the race was full. And how deep does your wait list get? We have 125 this year. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I know you're, I know you're thinking a lot of people signed up obviously for the, cause the 25th anniversary, but I don't think, it'll be a problem going forward at all. Just no. do it quicker than maybe even a couple days. Yeah, no, I love, I love the event. And um, that's why I only do one. A lot of times people ask, well, why don't you do a couple more? And I just see this as I just put it all into this one time of year and have a blast with it. And I feel like for me, I would have to make it more turnkey if I was going to do more than one. I'd rather just kind of blow the doors off with one big event. And I think it shows. I think people come and have a great time because there's that kind of energy there it's it's not turnkey right so you said that you know the community really embraces it do you find that most of your registered runners come from that community where where's most of your runners come from we have a pretty good split it is mostly like the bellingham seattle area we have a lot come down from bc the, we're just across the border. It's actually faster for me to go into downtown Vancouver than it is to drive into Seattle, believe it or not, even with the, the border crossing. So we get a lot of BC runners. And this year, and there's a few out of state and a few out of country, but we're pretty much this kind of Pacific Northwest. So those I have quite a contingent coming from Boulder, Colorado, and I might give that credit to the fact that I was living there the last four years. Yeah. <laughs> So when you get those out of town runners, what what are they? What's the one wow thing that they're gonna get on that course? Obviously, you're gonna give them the best customer service, but what are they gonna get on the course that is gonna be totally memorable? I think the ridge running along Chuckanut Ridge. It's three miles of the course, and you're up on this distinct ridge. The views, if it's clear, are amazing. The trail is super technical along there. Big rock slabs, moss. 
And what I love about the Northwest and what brought me back here after living away for so many years is the green. Like Eskimos have like so many names for snow. There's just different types of snow and they each have their own distinct name. I think the Pacific Northwest needs that for green. Like green just doesn't describe the different fern green, tree green, moss green. Like there's just, it's so lush up here. And I think people coming from out of this region aren't used to that level. Maybe New England, they get it, but <laughs> there's not many people that understand this, this level of lush. That's just, I mean, right now I'm just sitting all enticed. We've got snow and, and snow. <laughs> I'm thinking all of it, cause I know what you're talking about. So I'm like, Oh, that would be just amazing. Right. What about, is there like a distinct smell that goes along with that color of green? I think it changes. Does you know, it? it depends how what the temperature is out. This year we've had a lot more snow than normal, so the the temperature range has been broader than usual. We usually hang right around in the 40s this time of year, and we've been all the way down into the 20s and being blanketed in the white stuff. So, um, yeah, I've noticed different different smells up here than than usual. Usually it's just kind of right in that. Um, I don't know, range. And probably it's, I have a new dog. I added a dog to my life this year. Uh, she, I've had her for two months. She's sitting on my right foot right now. <laughs> um, and watching her in the snow versus the rain, how she reacts to the terrain kind of makes me more aware of that too. So, well, what's your dog's name? Her name is Petey, which stands for Piedra Dura, which is Spanish for hard rock. Oh, I like that. That's awesome. That's tricky. That is tricky. When it comes around, well, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you know, you, you win hard rock. You got to name your dog after. Is that one of your, is, so speaking of that, is that one of your favorite races? I know it's hard for you. It is one. Is it? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, course wise. Um, and actually it was, I named her Piedra for just rocks and trail runner and my Spanish minor and all that. My dad, I have to give him credit, actually came up with Dora as her middle name. <laughs> and so that's where the hard rock came from. Awesome. Well, so transitioning, you know, from, the, from Chuck and that, I mean, it's, you're a great salesperson. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, me and Joel would sign up today if we could, uh, <laughs> just even more reasons to do it. Um, but you have, a, you mentioned it's your only event you do like far as race directing, but you know, on top of that, you do some other fun things throughout the year that kind of give you that connection with other runners, right? Oh, totally. And that's evolved in the, um, the last couple of years with these running camps that are popping up around. And I feel like they've kind of gone through, a, a, there was a surge of them for a while and they kind of fell off. And I feel like people are getting back into this whole running camp idea, not, not just myself, but you're seeing them pop up around. Rob Carr's got some great camps going. Timmy Olsen's got some great camps going. And then I'm working with Mazamas in Oregon, so uh, organizing a group that's organizing it, I get to come in and be the coach, which is super cool. We get to run around Mount Hood. And Eleanor Fish has got a bunch of women's retreats, and she asked me to be one of the coaches this year for the event in the Swiss Alps. Oh, that's not a bad place, right? <laughs> oh, so excited. We're running hut to hut. There's only, I think there's only five or six spots left on that trip. Um, it's July 10th through the 16th. It is over Hard Rock of all weekends, but oh. that's when we could get the, the – hotels and inns logged or booked for ourselves. Yeah. So you say that's in the Swiss Alps and that's a, a six day hut to hut running camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a women's only and who, where, if someone's interested in that, where would they find information on that since there are six spots left? Yeah, it's runwildretreats.com. And then you just find the, there's a retreat link and the fourth one down Swiss Alps. I'm on the website right now. And then the Mazama one, that's Mount Hood, and that's uh, like two or three day camp, and you actually do a, a run around Mount Hood itself, right? Yeah, that one's more, I mean, we do some coaching, if you will. Jeff Browning and I, Bronco Billy and I put that one, are, are the coaches at that one. And we, if anybody's seen us interact, we're more like brother than sister than friends. And we just have a really, I love our dynamic, and I think it plays out with the crew as well. We had a really fun group last year. And it ends up being kind of a guided run around Mount Hood. So make sure you get around. Mazamas provides three aid stations in the 40-mile run, and it really makes for a fun day. We do a couple other runs and answer questions if people have, um, you know, want tips on running uphill or downhill or fu fueling. We kind of cover all that in a group campfire setting, if you will. But the focus of the weekend is being ready to run that 40 miles. So we 
are treating it kind of like a race weekend, not in the sense that it's competitive, but more like we're asking runners to come into it ready to run 40 miles and really have that experience. And that there, how many spots are you guys using in that one or having that one? Oh, good question. I want to say it's like 15 or 20. And registration for that just opened yesterday. Oh, wow. And that's the Mazama Ultra Runner Camp? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, if you haven't run around Hood on the Timberline Trail, it's, it's a pretty cool experience. It's one that I don't tire of. I've done it probably five times now. Well, the one that I, I think you need to do, and maybe you have, or, or it's, you need to do a Wonderland Trail Camp. Mm. That would be awesome. I'd love to get back down there and do it more of a sag wagging type. Yeah, that would be really cool. Because that's that's uh, probably one of the highest, I don't know, ranking things on my quote unquote bucket list of places to run and do is the Wonderland Trail. Yeah, it's a special one, that's for sure. You get such different terrains. You get that Pacific Northwest vibe on the what would it be the west side, and then the northeast side. You get up in that more glaciated, higher shoulder of Rainier. It's beautiful. What's the best time of year to do that? Like August. Yeah, probably it's August, September, you could even sneak into. Yeah, Darcy and I did it in, I guess it was late August that year that we did that. So that's just, I see just more and more people doing that, seeing some photos of it. It just looks incredible. Mm-hmm. Well, also, yeah, go wrong up there. and we also talked touch base. You've got uh, running your first ultra, which I have it's not an autographed copy by any means but uh oh come on we gotta fix that (laughs) but uh (laughs) what what a great book because you have a training plan in there right Uh, i do a couple of them 50k 50 mile and 100 mile and i think that's pretty unique because you don't see you see more of that online and a lot of times when you see these training plans you you know you should kind of have an idea who wrote them and, and their background but to have you have that in the book, I think is pretty, you know, not just for running your first ultra, but I think anybody could get great information of those training plans that maybe just get out and run to try and get the miles. Um, what kind of, I don't know, cause you, you coach. So what kind of led you to put like training plans in that book as opposed to just writing a book about running? Well, I give full credit to the publisher. They approached me and they are known for their how to type books. They do, they turn a lot of blogs into books. That's the chat, that's the group of Macmillan. Page Street Publishing is a, kind of falls under the Macmillan uh, mm. umbrella and that's where their focus is. So their ask was for this training manual uh, sense for ultra running because it's not really out there with like a full daily detailed book. And for them, they were super psyched that it was a woman that was able to put it together. I kind of pigeonholed myself, you, you nailed it with, saying that there's other people that aren't even running ultras can kind of get some information from it. Uh, the title pigeonholed me a little bit into the whole ultra world, but that's who I love coaching. I've been coaching for seven years now, and I really find myself honing in on the people that are getting into it for the first time or jumping up in their distance and trying like the, the 50 miler. They've done a 50K, but they want to know what running a 50 miler is. I like that, that intrigue and the level of surprise that comes for people and that's who I tend to gravitate towards with coaching so it made sense for me to talk to that person when I wrote a book how, let's go ahead no just to say so with your coaching how many uh athletes do you generally take on um with your coaching I max myself out at 10 which is not very many but I because of my I guess level of detail or I get kind of personally attached, if I'm completely honest. I have an Australian Shepherd as a dog, and that kind of, they say the dog finds you. Like, it makes, this dog breed makes sense for my own personality. I really enjoy, like, getting to know more specifics. And I I found that 10 is even, I have to, um, I have to limit myself there so that I can do it to the level that I want to. So how often do you have openings? Is it pretty, I mean, do you kind of do a wait list? (laughs) Yeah. Wait list on something like that. I mean, because if people, once they get involved, kind of stick around. I do. And then then everybody, like, because I focus on the like first time, they're only a first time for 
maybe three years, there was a woman that I coached her for 50K and then the next year 50 mile and the next year 100 miler. And now I'm watching her coach herself. And I think that's, I've done the best job then. If somebody feels that they've got all the tools that they now need to train themselves for these things, then I've done a good job. So I do, I do have turnover because people move on to maybe they want somebody to, to help them set their PR or you know, shift gears. And that's the cool thing about our ultra running world now is there's a lot of different coaches out there that specialize and focus on different things. The funny thing about my coaching is I've never advertised it other than like talking on podcasts or maybe it's written in a bio on an article that I've written or something, but that it's usually word of mouth. So the people um, come find me and I'm usually sitting between five and 10 clients very comfortably. And it's one of those things like you put the call out to the universe. I'm like, yeah, I could handle a few more right now. And right now I'm at 10. Wow. And, you know, earlier in the or end of last year, actually, I should say a year ago when I bought my place, I had like three because I was remodeling and there was I didn't have the space to to coach. So it kind of I feel like the universe really feeds me the athletes when it's when it's time. I haven't had the like wait list. Oh, my gosh, I can't take any more on right now. Feeling. <laughs> so so with your coaching, then you focus more, like you said, just on like the first time or the first you know, jump up in distance. So if, you know, if someone was looking for a coach to say, Hey, I want to, you know, I've run this race three times, but I haven't met my 50 mile goal yet. Is that, would you take people like that on? Or you kind of just like to focus? Oh. On time? No, totally. No, that's, that, that's that level of like, what do I need to tweak and what can I work on in this, in this realm, I guess that makes, yeah, that, I would, that fits into where I'm working too. Just that, like, I guess I'm not the person that's going to, like, um, help you place top 10, which is crazy because I am a competitive runner myself, but that's not who I like to, I don't tailor to that as well. I, I like the more intrigue of, like, figuring out what the body can do and how does life factor in. I think that was a big thing that came out in the book in the first, like, couple pages was helping people realize, like, this is a huge commitment and how much time do you really have and a lot of people can follow a training plan, but can they incorporate it into their lives? And that's where I feel like the spreadsheet that I work with with people and the communication that goes back and forth is me being able to help them say, like when they say, oh, Chrissy, I got sick for three days. Now what do I do? I'm that person that can kind of bounce the schedule around for them. I'm not going to write a week and say, do it. This is how you have to do it exactly. But I also try and incorporate life as well. So that person that hasn't been able to figure out how to get their PR, I'll start looking at other aspects of life and how that factors in. Like, is your work stress too much? Um, can you back off there? Like, what's your family commitment? What's your nutrition? How does your sleep factor in? And pull those big pieces into helping people uh, maybe achieve that better time. Yeah, you know, that's pretty interesting that you bring that up because we uh, we talk about coaching and different things a lot, and that's some really interesting things. Like I could just see you say, okay, well, number one, you need to quit your job, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you need to you need yeah. to quit your job. You need to get into a small <laughs> home, get a dog. And no, then no, no. You have to end back there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so people like running phones following me. <laughs> And, and, and if people are interested in, in contacting you, you have your website, it's chrissymel.com, and that kind of has your information because you do public speaking too, right? I do, yeah. Do you do a lot of that? Because I've seen like your TED Talk and, and stuff like that. Do you do a lot of public speaking? I would like to do more. It's um, I actually have a few more events this year than normal. I actually joined Toastmasters this year because I honestly, I have a huge fear of public speaking. I don't think, I know I'm not alone in that. The Toastmasters actually has a, a stat that m people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of dying. So I fall into a pretty common category there, but I just push myself to try and try and do it and become better at it. So hopefully, yeah, there's a couple of events this year that I'm looking forward to. The Wenatchee running group is having me over the weekend after checking it, and then the San Luis Obispo, the race slow. I spoke down there last year, and they are having me back this year. So yeah, some fun stuff. So when when do you ever come through Utah? Just OR time? I usually come through. see you. Yeah, I usually OR. Yeah, but well, oh, there's a whole can of worms right there. Are you guys going to have one? <clears throat> no. Nope. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> so, so that stings. Yeah. So actually, so this year, that's kind of an interesting bit on a personal front. I bought a place a year ago, and I still found myself 
sleeping in other beds more than my own. So I, the last seven years of this ultra running career, I have traveled like a crazy one. My passport's my like most favorite possession because it's full. Like I have to order more pages. And I think that's a pretty cool aspect that running allowed me to do to um, kind of switch gears a little bit and just see what the like local scene is like. I put a boundary on myself of 360 miles that I'm not allowed to travel outside of that radius unless I'm being paid or contracted. And it's put a different spin on the year. Like I'm enduring the winter here in Washington rather than hopping on a plane and going to Moab and running the, the well, actually they didn't have very good weather this year either. Did they? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> why 360 miles? The area code for this region is 360. Oh, uh, look at that. You're all, you're all crap. Huh? I'm kind of crappy like that. <laughs> So is your, do you find that your, your uh, competitive racing, is that kind of not, you don't do that nearly as much now? Is that kind of on the back burner or is there still some things out there you want to do? There's probably still some things out there that I, I'm interested in doing. I found that, um, like, for example, last year I got to run Cascade Crest, which came up kind of last minute, really. It was like two months prior to the race and the race director um, had a spot open up and asked, it was a, kind of a special situation. And because I'd never run it, and it's my backyard, I grew up in this area, and I never ran Cascade Crest, it had a really special meaning to get to run Cascade Crest in my first year of living back in this area. So I'm finding that the races, for me, it has this other level. It's not just going to race anymore. Like, there's got to be this other connection to why I'm doing it. And uh, it makes it more fun if there's more story that goes into it. I think I'm becoming more of a storyteller in my older years. Because, I mean, you know, people that aren't aware, I mean, you've got, what, you've over 100, well over 100 races, right? I mean, you've run up well over 100 races. You know, you've got yeah female wins in 55 or more <laughs> at those races. That's pretty good finish. By <laughs> yeah, right? And then, and then, of course, you know, UTMB, win and, and hard rock. I mean, those, that's, I don't know. There's not a whole lot left out there for you to conquer. Oh, I don't know about conquering. Just, I feel like the mountains have let me through in a very kind way. <laughs> I never try and conquer mountains. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think you mountain. could really, but, right. but yeah, I mean, that just kind of leaves a little bit to the, so is there stuff races out there that you want to do that they're calling you that you haven't done yet, or maybe want to go back to that you really want to, go back and do those? Uh, I, you know, it sounds silly because I can run it any day of the week uh, living where I do now, but I look forward to the day that I get to run Chuck and Nut again. Like my first, it was my first and it would be fun to get to race it at some point again. It won't be a race, obviously. There, there's no way I'll run the time I ran in 2000, but um, I think that would be a really fun, like kind of full circle story, getting to run the race again. Um, and I'm looking more at like local adventures. We've got such a great playground here with the Olympics and the North Cascades and the Canadian Coastal Range. Um, I have some dreams of doing the West Coast Trail out on Vancouver Island. And um, just I bought a bunch of maps this year for my birth or for I guess last year for my birthday and highlighting as many routes on there, kind of in the of the vein of the Barkley Lars. You know how he had that map that he highlighted all the roads he'd ever run. Yeah. You see that. Map? Yeah, I want to do that on local maps and stuff up here. So that's more my driving running force now is that exploration element. Well, and, and with your new little running buddy, you got to get out a lot more because uh, he, he's going to require a little bit more, right? Oh, she's awesome. She's already done. I'm super careful. Like people told me you shouldn't run dogs um, too long until they're a year and a half. And she's just over a year, but she's done 18 miles and she's still pulling me at the end. So <laughs> We only run like three days a week right now, but she's going to be a little beast for sure. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I've had a great, I mean, me and Joel are sitting here just kind of shaking our head when you say stuff, because when you do talk about your race or, you know, your public speaking or your camps, you can just hear the excitement in your voice about everything you're involved with. And I think that mm. that kind of goes into everything you do and that's why they're so successful. Um, so, I mean, we can't thank you enough for, bearing with us taking yeah. the time to, to uh, <laughs> on the right. horn as we had technical difficulties um but yeah we would yeah, uh, if you're ever come through utah you got to make sure you let us know though 
Oh, for sure. Yeah, may, probably not. Well, unless there's like some gig that brings me out, but maybe next year. I'm going to stay local. Come this way. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I've gone and stayed on so many people's couches over the years. Now I'm saying, come this way. I've got a guest room. Come visit me. I'll show you the Northwest. I think Chuck and that's on the radar for oh, next year. Yeah, for sure. So we actually yeah. just had a friend move up there from uh, Utah. He, he teaches at Western Washington University. His name is Jeff Hart. Oh, and, uh, oh I met Jeff. I yeah, met him on the um, Cutthroat Classic Trail last summer. Yeah, he, to he told me that story, actually, which is kind of funny. But yeah, yeah he, he got into hard rock this year. And he's told, you know, he's reached out and says, man, I've got a place. You guys can come up anytime. You know, I'll show you around as soon as he figures out where to go. But he loves it up there. Oh, cool. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I think he was just moving here maybe or something. What's that? So I think he was just moving here. Yep, he was. Right. So, that sound right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the story. And he says, and then I like saw her and started talking to her. And he's like, I probably felt like, looked like a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> So it's always funny. It doesn't happen with enough frequency, but to get recognized out, like running is probably more common than like walking around the streets of Bellingham. But when you do, when I do get recognized, it's, you don't know if it's like because of the running realm or if it's because I went to high school with you or <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to have somebody approach you like that. Yeah. Joel has that problem all the time. He, he never knows where they know him from. Yeah. He's it's popular. uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you handle that so let's before we let you go so so what's the best way to to approach chrissy when you're out on the trail oh just say hi yeah I'll probably don't shake my don't shake my hand give me a hug oh <laughs> and just say hi i know you from high school or hi i know you from yeah. <laughs> <laughs> been running long no. <laughs> oh now can you hear her in the background that's right we got her we got her on she's getting after you to go out for her afternoon walk huh actually we're going for a run we're headed up to the north chuckanut trail nice well chrissy thank you so much thank you so much for uh joining us and, and getting on our show we we with you nothing but the success for chuckanut the 25th anniversary it sounds like it's going to be cool. thank you guys yeah it sounds like it's going to be amazing I hope so. I'm putting a lot into it. I promise you, I will be more tired putting on that race than I would be running it. <laughs> That's usually how it happens. But we'll uh, we'll definitely want to touch base later. We're gonna uh, leave some links on our uh, our post here that show some of the camps and you know ways to get in contact. Oh, cool. with you if they're looking for someone to drag you out of the 360 mile radius and have <laughs> you speak or or whatever it is. <laughs> but thank you so much. That's great. Always a pleasure. You're one of the people that we uh, like most in in this in this uh, fun endeavor of trail running, just because of who you are. So thank you so much. Well, we come from a great tribe, I believe. And uh, yeah, we we uh, have many good people that set the, the the tone or the pace for us for sure. Awesome, cool. I'm glad you guys are doing this podcast. This is awesome. It's yeah, me. Get to know knew a few more of the personalities. Well, it made me nervous when you reached out because you said that you and Luke and Bronco Billy had a discussion about it. I'm like, ah, oh, what did those two clowns say now? Oh, especially Luke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all positive, all positive. Well, that's that's good. That made me happy because I'm like, I'll, I'll drive up to Pocatello and talk to Luke. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show up at his work. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, thanks, Chrissy. Go ahead and... Uh, Get out on your run and keep getting prepared for your big uh, 25th anniversary, and we'll uh, hopefully talk to you again. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for listening to the Trail Manners Podcast. We'd like to thank Chrissy Mel for taking the time to join us today, especially talking about the Chuckanut 50K, the 25th anniversary of that. And you can check more of that out at chuckanut50krace.com. Don't forget the race.com on there. And also check out more of her stuff, her book, her camp she has this summer we'll have more links in the show notes so don't forget to check that out we also want to encourage everybody to follow us on instagram twitter and facebook at trail manners or swing by the website at trailmanners.com right now this month we have 25 percent off using trail manners 25 in the store page also you can contact us let us know what you want to see who you want to hear or even if you would like to be on the show so until next time this is eric manning with joel hatch reminding you you don't get what you wish for you get what you work for now go get it.